grieving. I know a lot of people have lost loved ones, especially this past year. And we have support groups, some of which are meeting in person safely, some of which are, are meeting on Zoom. So again, you can go to our website or um, call our phone number if you're interested in finding out about that. So I'm so grateful today to have Mary Nykamp from Jekyll and Nykamp. She has been practicing for, she's gonna give us more details of how long she's been practicing and she has wonderful ideas to give us. Um, and then after the event, I will send a, an email with her contact information if you would like to consult with her about some questions you have about your personal situation. So thank you, Mary, for coming today. All right, can you all hear me now? Yeah, okay. Well, it's nice to be here with all of you. I'm sorry we can't be in person, but certainly we're all grateful we have this technology so we can still communicate. I'm sure you feel that way with your family members and all during this difficult time. So 2020 certainly has been kind of a crazy year for all of us. Um, most of you may know, uh, according to Doug, uh, do see we were essential services or we are essential workers. So we were able to stay open in, uh, the pandemic changed our practice, um, changed uh, some of the things I'm seeing uh, in my work. So one of the things I that kind of came to the forefront is people procrastinating. This, uh, you know, before they kind of would come to me and say, you know, I meant to be, you know, doing this a year ago, um, but now I'm coming to see you. Well, with the pandemic, this kind of brought everything to a forefront. People were concerned. Um, they thought, you know, I haven't started my estate plan. Now I'm more concerned about, you know, the, you know, what might happen to me in the future. I really need to start on that. Or they may have wanted to make changes to their estate plan and just didn't get around to it. So suddenly this became, you know, kind of a forefront. People were thinking about these things. Uh, and as a result, I've kept very, very busy this year. Um, so, you know, I think this is sort of a lesson learned for all of us not to procrastinate and sort of, you know, take care of these things because they can be very important. So one of the things I'm just gonna to talk to you about a few documents that you might consider or that hopefully you have. So first I'm gonna speak a little bit about durable powers of attorney. So durable financial powers of attorney. These are documents where you designate someone to make medical or excuse me, to make financial decisions for you if you're unable to do so. Um, and having said that, you can actually draft them or have them drafted such that they are effective when you sign them, or they can be effective upon an event. And usually that would be incapacity. And certainly your document needs to you know, specify what that is. So for example, powers of attorney may say, you know, I designate so-and-so to make financial decisions for me. This document will become effective if one doctor determines I'm unable to manage my affairs. So it could be drafted that way. They legally call that a springing power of attorney because it springs into existence versus one that is effective when you sign it. A lot of my clients who are married uh, make the power of attorney effective immediately as to their spouse but then may make it effective uh, upon incapacity as it pertains to you know, their children or whoever they might want to name on that document. So really important document to have. It allows someone to manage those assets in your name alone, right? So those of you who have trusts, that's a separate kind of thing we'll talk about, but this allows them to manage, you know, your car that's in your name, or those of you who don't have trust, maybe most of your assets are in your name alone. So really important document to have. Make sure you name alternates, right? Don't just name your spouse and no one as a backup. I see that all the time. Uh, what if your spouse becomes ill or your spouse predeceases you and now you're, you know, 
you, you become incapacitated or need help. For those of you who have IRAs, 401ks, you know, those kinds of plans, as you know, I'm sure those have to be in your individual name, right? You can't hold those jointly. So powers of attorney, even more important. A uh, word of caution here is some companies, even though the powers of attorney I draft for my documents are legally valid and they comply with the statute, some companies uh, require their own form. So if, for example, your accounts are at Ameriprise, Ameriprise has their own specific IRA uh, power of attorney. Check on those. Hey, Mary, I'm worried. I'm in, I'm in the hospital. No one can write checks for me or help me. So you certainly want to make sure that you've got that document in place. All right, and, and incidentally, I didn't mention, um, but I'm happy to take any questions at the end. Um, so if you have something, you might want to jot it down, um, and I, I'm happy to, to, to address those at the end of my uh, presentation. So that's, you know, durable powers of attorney. Uh, one, one thing before I move on. So I mentioned that some institutions are quite picky about these powers of attorney. So trust is generally a better way or a better um, option for protecting against incapacity. Trusts are never questioned. Sometimes these institutions, like I say, have their own form. Um, and so just, just a word of caution there. Now, switching gears a little bit. So the other question people had, particularly with COVID and everything going on is, uh, you know, Mary, I haven't done a medical or a healthcare power of attorney. So extremely do important document. And I tell people if, if 18 years of age and older should have a healthcare power of attorney. So even some of my clients whose kids are going off to college, you know, they, if your kids are over 18, you have no legal say and no, you know, right to make medical decisions. So my, my advice, anybody over 18 should have a health care power of attorney. Make sure you name alternate agents, just like on the financial durable power of attorney, name backups, because we don't know if that person's going to be available. Um, some, of, some of my clients are more flexible on this document than, for example, financial documents. Only one of your kids may be able to get here or be available to make medical decisions if, you know, if need be. So try to be a little more flexible. Most of you may know if you've been in Arizona for a while, we do mental health care powers of attorney here as well. Really another important document. Um, sometimes we will see them uh, combined with the health care power of attorney but really important to have this. Um, this allows your agent to authorize psychiatric or mental health care uh, evaluation or treatment if needed. Um, I can tell you I had a case not so long ago where I had to appoint a guardian, a wife, a wife's husband ended up in the SAGE unit, which is the psychiatric unit at Del Webb, didn't have this mental, he, he had not signed a mental health care power of attorney, they would not let her uh, authorize, evalu you know, evalu have them evaluated or authorize treatment. So we had to go to court and have a guardian appointed. So simple documents really, um, but really important to have. And I think again, you know, this past year has brought up the importance of, of having these documents uh, available. And sometimes people couldn't get into the hospital to see um, their loved ones and so forth. Um, I, this is one um, document that I do provide contact information on because we want your doctors to be able to get a hold of your, your agent if need be. I don't generally put that in wills and trusts and so forth, um, but I do in this, in this case. I'd also mention this is a document you should give, give out, right? your trust, your will, you know, your last will and testament, you may want to keep private, you may not want out there, 
but your healthcare power of attorney, I really recommend give your agent copies, right? If you land in the hospital, they need that. Give copies to your doctor, the hospitals out here in Sun City and probably all over, but I happen to know a uh, banner out here will we'll scan them in and keep them on file. So if you land in the hospital, they've got immediate access to that document. You can also in Arizona register medical documents with the Secretary of State. So that's health and mental health care power of attorney. If you do that, you get a card with a password uh, and username. And so if you were traveling, if any of us are lucky to travel again, uh, you know, you can access those documents easily. So some people choose uh, to do that as well. All right, so living wills I mentioned uh, briefly, these are essentially your declaration that you don't wanna be kept alive if two doctors say you're terminal in an irreversible coma or a persistent vegetative state. Now you can vary that however you want, but that's kind of the, our statutory guidance. So if that's important to you, make sure you have that document. Again, don't, don't wait and say, oh, well, I'm gonna do that later. Um, I would get it in place. In Arizona, we have one additional document. Um, not a lot of my clients do them, but they are called pre-hospital medical directives. I don't know why they have to have this long name, but they are essentially DNRs do not resuscitate. They're on bright orange paper, they have to be. Um, and so if you are in a situation where you say under no circumstances do I want anybody to call 911 to resuscitate me, that might be a doc document you consider. The clients that I have that do them are essentially, you know, basically in hospice kind of situations or, or very chronically um, ill. All right, so, you know, while preparing these documents, you know, it's not so difficult, it hasn't been so difficult in the past year. Um, you know, most of my clients I'm meeting on Zoom and, and phone calls, just like we're doing uh, today, but getting them signed, of course, is not so easy. So a lot of these documents require witnesses and a notary. Um, hospitals uh, have been very, difficult about and, and understandably so about allowing people in to see patients. So that that has been very logistically difficult. Some of my clients and maybe some of you um, have been in lockdown, um, so you can't leave. Um, some facilities have been kind of, you know, help very helpful, I guess, in providing witnesses and notaries. So I have to give instructions. Um, others, you know, don't do that. So it's um, it's been very challenging. Um, I mentioned to Daphne that we are for signings. We are doing 99% out in our parking lot. We come out. We have a table, which somebody stole. So now we lock it down. Uh, but anyway, we we sign up there to provide the most you know safety and distancing. Um, now. Hopefully with vaccinations, let's hope that all changes in the, in the future. All right, so I mentioned uh, trust as well. So trust give a little more protection in the event you become incapacitated. Most of you, I don't wanna, uh, you probably attended seminars about trust, so I don't wanna go into too much detail, but um, they certainly can, you know, distribution. So you say, you know, everything goes to my two kids, but if one of them doesn't survive, and I want it held in trust for their education, you know, until such and such an age. Um, and again, I mentioned, if you become incapacitated, you won't have an issue with um, an institution honoring that document and allowing your successor trustee to step in. Um, making changes to wills, so your last will and testament, changes to wills require two witnesses. Preferably, they should also be notarized, so they're a little 
uh, more complicated in getting them executed. But if you're relying on a will, make sure you keep that updated um, as well. Normally, trusts only need a signature, uh, uh, excuse me, a notary. So you sign it in the presence of a notary and that document uh, is valid. So planning for the future, you know, um, I think this really um, emphasizes the importance of providing for contingent situations. So have backup on your financial durable power of attorney, your health care, mental health care power of attorney, have successor trustees if indeed you have a trust, name some backups, right? We don't know what's gonna happen in the future. That doesn't mean you can't change it, but at least have those contingencies addressed. Same with distribution. You know, I, I can't tell you how many clients tell me, I say, well, what if one of your kids predeceases you, or maybe they don't have kids? What if one of your nieces and nephews predeceases you? Well, Mary, I'll come back and see you then. Um, you know, then is sometimes complicated, as we know from this past year. Plus, you know, you could be incapacitated at that point. So, I always say, you know, give it, give it your best guess now um, in terms of all those contingencies. You know, if it doesn't, if you want to change it in the future, certainly you can do that. So, per, you know, if, if anything has changed in your circumstances, take a look at your documents. You know, those of you uh, who have trust, take a look at your trust. Otherwise, take a look at your wills and powers of attorney. Um, most of us, you know, put those things away. We think I'm done with that uh, and don't, don't get them out and, and look at them. And there's certainly there's some things that may need to be changed. In terms of attorney review, there's no, there's no law, but our rule of thumb in our practice is we meet with clients every three years, our existing clients, uh, and uh, at no charge and kind of go over their documents with them. It's also a good chance for us to review any changes in the law that might affect you. So that's kind of what we do. Um, so if, if any of you haven't had your, your documents reviewed by your attorney, you might wanna contact him or her and say, hey, you know, let's, let's just take a look at it. Look at these, do we need to change anything? Certainly trusts that were drafted many years ago, and I, I see these all the time, um, the estate tax exemption was much, much less. So they were drafted in a more complicated way to minimize estate taxes. Now, and we'll talk about estate tax in a minute, the estate tax exemption is so high, they come to me after one of, a, a spouse has died and we're stuck with this very complicated scenario that's not doing them any, you know, it's not a benefit to them. So take a look at your documents, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, meet with your attorney. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the estate tax. Uh, most of you may have, may know it's gone to years. So this year, 2000. Uh, Could you repeat that, Mary? You kind of blipped out okay. on us for a minute. All right. Uh, so the estate tax exemption went up significantly uh, into that, well, the last several years, but 2021, so for this year, the estate tax exemption equivalent is, is $11,700,000. So, oh, you know, you. quite a lot for most of us. Um, uh, but this does sunset in 2020. What will happen then? And as you know, these things are only as good as, you know, the, the president or whoever's in charge. So this year with the, with, you know, a little bit change in complexion in the White House, uh, we could see this number go down. I mean, it's not written in stone. Uh, so in, you know, there's a lot of spending, so they need money, you know, they may need some money. So they may, you know, lower this exemption a lot, but that's what it is right now. Most of you may know uh, Arizona has no 
inheritance tax or estate tax. So I would say good place to die. Some of the Midwest states still still do have inheritance tax, um, but not Arizona. So you're only subject, you know, to the, the federal limit. Uh, okay, so so again, I guess this goes back to the flexibility issue. So trust for years, back when you could only pass 600,000 estate tax free, trusts were drafted uh, to, for those of you who were married, uh, to create two trusts at the first death commonly called the Survivor's Trust and Decedent's Trust. This is the arrangement I mentioned that now most of you may not need because of this $11 million exemption. Uh, first of all, look at your documents. But secondly, the way I draft most of my documents now is to provide that everything continues on for the surviving spouse because we don't need to have this separate trust but I allow the survivor to disclaim some assets into an irrevocable trust. So it gives that surviving spouse an option. So if, you know, the president, Congress lowers this exemption so that we're all a little more concerned, again, providing flexibility, I think is, is kind of the name of the game. All right, um, portability. So. I don't want to get too complicated on this estate tax stuff, but let me just tell you, this is new, I don't know, in the last I, I several years. When a spouse dies, so it's, it's only for you all who are married, the spouse dies, you have the option to file an estate tax return. It's called a 706 to elect portability. What this means is my spouse left everything to me, so he or she did not use their exemption, so I want it. So you elect to have their unused exemption brought over to you. So now you have a $22 million, say, uh, exemption. Now you think, well, why would I want to do that? Well, if they lower that estate tax exemption to 500000 for example, you brought that $11 million exemption that your spouse didn't use over to you. So it's kind of, again, allows flexibility, gives you some assurance that you're never gonna have to pay, hopefully pay uh, estate tax. So that's called portability. So just keep in mind, it has to be done within nine months of, of date of death. So I am doing quite a lot of them, uh, more 706s than I have for a number of years because uh, people are worried about the future. They don't know what the exemption is going to be, you know, in the years to come. So this gives them uh, a little peace of mind. All right, let's um, let's talk a little bit about IRAs. So many more of my clients that as as the younger generation is is coming up, you know, so much of their uh, of their estate, of their assets is in, are in qualified plans. So 401ks, 403bs, IRAs. So as you, most of you know, they're kind of tricky to deal with. They're great savings devices, right? But uh, not so great for passing on to, to others because you all never paid, right? We never paid tax on this, we put this in our IRAs, it grew, now we, we need to leave it to someone. So the SECURE Act passed January 1st of last year, 2020, so it's pretty new. Uh, what that did, so, so the law before SECURE, the, the SECURE Act was this, you could leave your IRA to your kids, for example, and they could take it as an inherited IRA, take it out over their life expectancy. So if their life expectancy was 40 years, they could take 140th out and so forth, 139th, so that they could defer this income tax for a long time, right? Um, the SECURE Act changed that. So now they have to take it out within 10 years. 
So that's a, can be a hefty, you know, price tag, income tax uh, hit to, to your kids. If you are charitably inclined, and you know, Daphne talked about Benavia at the beginning of this program, they do such fantastic work in this community. It's unbelievable. I have so many clients who have needed those services and, and have received those services. Think about naming a charity because charities don't have to pay income tax. So maybe you leave your other assets, you know, your, your non-IRA, your non-qualified assets to your kids or to your relatives or whoever your beneficiaries might be. But think about leaving some, it doesn't have to be 100%, it could be 50%, it could be 10% to a charity. So you leave, you know, you name uh, Benavia as a 50% beneficiary on your IRA, they receive it no income tax. So not only are you, you know, leaving a larger gift because because of that, then if your kids got it, you know, you're you're also leaving a legacy. Um, you know, you're leaving something in for a long, long period of time. So I'd ask you to think about that certainly with your IRAs. The other thing, you know, as you take your RMDs, your required minimum distributions, Right now you can divert those to charity. So I have a number of clients and relatives actually who don't really need their RMDs or certainly not all of them. So it, you know, those who leave like to leave money to their church, to Benavia, to whatever charity of your choice, that is a good use of that money because again, that gets that income out of your uh, you know, out of your 1040, your income tax return and and benefits the, the charity. So really nice way, you know, to 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 get some money to to charities and lessen your income taxes and potentially those of your kids or, or whoever your beneficiaries are. So, you know, think about that um, even as backup beneficiary. So I mentioned the importance of a flexibility. Um, so maybe you name, you know, your kids or your nieces and nephews as your beneficiaries. Um, but what if they don't survive you? Charity is a nice backup beneficiary. They're going to be there. Um, uh, so, you know, if your kids don't, don't survive you or your nieces and nephews don't survive you, it's good, good backup. All right, so I'm happy to entertain questions. Daphne, did you have anything else you wanted to say at this point? Um, just that if any of you are interested in finding out more about IRA rollover gifts, it's a very easy thing. You could call our offices and feel free to ask any questions related to that. Um, but yeah, if any of the rest of you, we have a big group here, so you'll have to be patient. Um, if you raise your hand, if you have a question, you can just raise it on and, the screen. And Daphne, we should, we should also mention, because I do this every year, you can also take advantage of the, and Daphne can fill you in on this, but the, the tax credit yes. um, uh, on your income tax too. Because, and I forget what the, what the exact term that you are. It's called the Arizona State Tax Credit. And I will send a flyer to all of you um, when we, you know, after this meeting, because it is something that you can basically dollar for dollar. A lot of you know about it. It's instead of giving it to Arizona, you decide you want it to go to a certain charity. Um, so it's money you would actually have to pay anyway to the government. So it's a wonderful way to do that. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So questions. Um, so maybe, um, Annalena, you can. Beverly looks like she has a question. If you are not on the video video screen and you have a question, put a little question in the chat box underneath you and we can try to open you up, okay? We can't see your hand if you're not on the screen. <laughs> okay, Beverly. Go ahead, Beverly. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question, Mary. When your spouse passes away, do you need to have your trust redone and what about uh, if you have um, 
anything uh, other than you trust your IRAs or anything to, that, to, to take their name off of it? All right, so yeah. So when is back? Mm -hmm. uh, we keep we keep losing you, Mary. Oh, can you we hear me now? You. Yes. Okay, sorry. So so when a spouse dies, um, my recommendation is that you have your trust amended. It's sometimes a very brief amendment to say, you know, that that your spouse has passed, that they are no longer a trustee, that you are the sole trustee. And that, you know, henceforth, your social security number will be the tax identification number for the trust. Mm -hmm. Normally, in, in most cases, you've named your spouse as your primary agent under your, uh, you know, financial, health care, power of attorney. So a uh, good idea to update those. Otherwise, you're always going to have to have a death certificate everywhere you go. So that's my recommendation on that. On IRAs, um, remember, if, if your spouse had an IRA, he passed, then you are going to look at your options. And as a surviving spouse, you still have the option to roll the IRA to you. And then you can take it out just like an IRA if you have one, in other words, over your life expectancy. You wanna make sure then you update the beneficiaries, all right? because you probably have your spouse as the beneficiary on your IRA, so update the beneficiaries. One other thing, let me mention, because it's important, is let's say you, you have a trust, let's say you have a brokerage account in your trust that you and your husband created, or you and your spouse created. When the spouse dies, all of those assets in the trust get a what they call a step-up in basis. So what that means is it, they, all those assets get a new cost basis, which is the date of death value. And that can be significant in eliminating gains. So you go sell a stock at that point, your gain or loss would be probably zero because you have this new cost basis. So it's important, most brokerage firms know this, but some aren't familiar with community property law, which is what we are here in Arizona, and that makes a huge difference in terms of this step up in basis. So Beverly, does that answer your question? Well, exactly what is the step up in basis? So the step up, the new cost basis for all those assets in the trust is what the value was on the date of the spouse's death. Okay. So right. that should be documented and your broker, for example, should adjust the cost basis on your in your account. I mean, you should be able to see that, that, you know, before your cost basis is what you paid for it. Now that's going to be adjusted to the date of death value. So it's a, it's a, it could be a huge thing in some cases. Yeah, well, my, my trust company says they will not take my husband's name off of his trust unless I have the trust redone. Yeah. Some are picky that so that, that it should be it shouldn't be need to be redone. You probably just need a brief amendment to say he's deceased. Now you're the sole trustee, and you get that from the lawyer, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Shouldn't take a, it. Shouldn't be very involved. I mean, most of the ones I do like that, maybe an hour of my time. So it should not be a costly thing to do to, right. to update all the documents. Okay. Thank you very much, Mary. Sure. All right, any other questions? I think Carolyn, Carolyn. Carolyn, okay. Carolyn, can you unmute yourself? Do you see her, Annalena? I do, but I, I'm asking her to unmute, but I, I don't know if she sees a prompt. <laughs> There, I'm go. unmuted. Okay, Hi. sorry about Hi, that. Carolyn. <laughs> Hello there. Um, we have two houses in two locations and two children. Okay. So our living trust says that one of them goes to this child and one of them goes to this child. Okay, one wait, I lost, I lost you just for a second. So two houses, two kids. And in two states. Okay. Okay. Our living will says that one of the houses goes to this child and the other house goes to this child. That's designated already. Okay. However, what 
do we need to do in addition to that? Is there, you know, some big tax difference when that gets switched over? How does that go about? So, so this is going to happen. Are, are you married? Married, yes. So, so it's going to happen. We're both living. It's going to happen at the second death, right? Okay. Okay. And are both are both properties in Arizona or no? One's in Minnesota and one's in Arizona. Okay. Okay. And they're both in your trust. Right. Okay, so so it'll be this. It, it shouldn't be any tax difference. Well, certainly not in Arizona. I can tell you that. I don't know if Minnesota has any. I don't think they have any inheritance tax or anything. So I, you should not have any tax consequence with doing that. Your kids will receive their house again. They'll get that step up in cost basis. So uh, at that point in time your successor trustee or trustees, if that's your kids, whoever it is, will will deed those, actually deed those properties to your kids. Okay. And no big tax, they won't have to pay, pay a big amount and we won't have to pay a big amount. Should it? Nope, shouldn't need to. They, okay. I, mean, I mean, inheritances, you receive tax-free. Even, even if you left your kid a million bucks, it's tax-free. The only time we worry about tax is with tax deferred accounts like IRAs and so forth. So no, that should not create a tax issue. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Do All we right. have any, any other, other questions? John? John was next, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? I can. Yes, uh, just a quick question. Are directives uh, health or financial uh, directives that have been established in other states legal in the state of Arizona? Yes, yeah, so if, if any of you have documents that were drafted in other states, Arizona recognizes them execute. If you're gonna remain an Arizona resident, I would ha probably have your attor an attorney here look at them, just uh, make any recommendations under Arizona law. Once in a while, there's difference in uh, interpretation of documents, but, but really the short answer is yes. I mean, if you did your will in another state, as long as it was validly executed there, it's valid in Arizona. I do, however, review, I have lots of lots of transplants, all right, clients who are transplants from other states and we do review them, particularly, particularly if you lived in a non if you're married and you lived in a non-community property state, there's sometimes uh, more work that we need to do. Okay, anybody else? Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, Daphne, do you see anybody else? John, did you have another question? I can't hear you. Just a moment. Just unmute yourself, John. There How's we go. That? Yes. Yeah, okay. we can hear you now. What was your question? Another one? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, what percentage of Mary's business is uh, is estate planning. Okay, yeah, so um, I didn't talk a lot about myself, did I? But um, I've been out in Sun City for 30 plus years. Uh, I, hate to, I hate to admit that, but that I've been in practice that long. Um, really 100% of what I do is estate planning. So, and, and let me just kind of uh, expound on that a little bit. So estate planning is the major focus of my practice. We. I also do probates, which is for individuals who haven't done trust, we end up, you know, going through probate. I also do some guardianship conservatorship work that's all kind of part of the probate code. Um, but that's 100% of my practice. So I don't, did you lose me? All right. Um, I don't do anything else. I mean, I don't do family law or any of that sort of thing. So really that's all I do. Thank you very much. Sure. 
Eileen has a question. Eileen, can you unmute yourself? I think she's trying. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Now I forgot the question. Oh, do you provide fiduciary services? We generally do not. Um, I, there are a few, I have a few clients who insist I be their successor trustee or personal representative, but I really, really don't uh, do that on a regular basis. Um, I, I find that quite honestly, um, and I am a successor trustee right now in a case, but so I do do it. I, I, I don't think it's necessarily the best from an economic standpoint. Um, my paralegals bill at 165 an hour, they do a lot of the and, but my recommendation usually is consider a private fiduciary. If you, if you don't have a family member, consider right. a private fiduciary. There's a couple I work with that I like. Also, of course, banks and trust companies will serve as in, in some cases. Some of them are kind of picky about what kinds of assets you have and then and the amount, you know, the, the, the amount. But uh, those are all good options. But I would say as a general rule, um, I don't do that. Okay. Thank you. All right. So Annalena, did you see a chat? There is a chat. Let's see if I can, okay. Oh, they don't like, they don't like my internet connection. Am I, am oh. I getting that a lot? You were a little bit of, choppiness, a few words here and there, so. Okay, I apologize for that. I usually don't have that problem. Must be the weather. The weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Beverly has another question, Annalita. Okay. Just a second, Beverly. Un Unmute yourself. <laughs> She's having trouble, it looks like. There, uh, there we go. There we go. Mary, could you give us your full name and the name of your company? Yeah, I will send that to you, okay. Beverly, via email if you'd like. Okay. okay. Are you comfortable with that? Yes, I am. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah, I will do that tonight or tomorrow. Okay. Okay. That's fine. No hurry. Okay. Yeah. Just a second, I'm, uh, that should have my email and address and probably phone number and stuff, right, Daphne? Yes. Yeah. Yes. If there are no further questions, I just want to express my appreciation to Mary. She did a wonderful presentation. And like I said, if you have additional questions that are more personal to your situation, I would suggest calling her and setting up an appointment. Um, She's wonderful. We've known her and had a great partnership in the community for a long time. Um, also, if you guys have any questions about services that Benavia provides or giving opportunities or, you know, IRA rollover gifts, um, feel free to call us, reach out to us and keep um, in touch with the website because we have these educational sessions all year long related to financial matters and caregiving matters. Um, so this might be of help to you. Hopefully next fall we can start meeting in person. We hope. <laughs> yeah. I hope you all can get vaccinated or if you choose to do that and um, stay healthy. So thank you so much for participating. We so appreciate you. And have a great rest of the day. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Right.